Well, my start, the first, first time I remember coming to this building, coming to this theatre, of course it didn't look like this then, but I remember coming to this building, it must have been, I guess, my guess would be about 1965, 66, coming to see the pantomime here, where I would have been nine, eight, nine or ten, something like that. And um, The weird thing about it is, I remember, I thought the music was great, because it was loud and brash and bold, I thought that was all good, and I like, and always have liked music that sort of smacks of the, the old-fashioned variety shows, you know? And that I remember really well, but I couldn't tell you anything about the star names who were in it at that point. I don't remember that. I, 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 having looked back now, I suspect it was probably, I think it was Jess Conrad, around that time anyway. But I don't know if that was the case. But, um, but then later on, when um, my, my, I was already studying music then, my background in music is choral singing, you know. So I was a chorister at St Mary's and at St Jude's, up at my, which is my home church. And then I was lucky enough, I went to Westminster Abbey and did the, did the summers there, you know. And that was fantastic, big, big learning curve for me. So you learn a lot about music. So, But that almost seems to me as if that belies the fact that I really liked that theatre music I was coming to listen to as well. But I did, I thought it was great. And then later on then, when, uh, when I was in secondary school, there were trips used to come here from where my father worked, you know. Uh, so we'd come down as a big troop of kids and we'd all be placed together in a big block as still happens now, you know, and we'd watch the show, and I can remember seeing Ryan and Ronnie here, um, but never did it, I never thought it was a, I'd love to do that, I just thought, I really like that, it's great, you know, so I went on, um, drifted, drifted through school really, wasn't very good at anything except music, you know, and drifted off to university to go and study music and all that, and uh, spent three fantastic years doing that with no intention, no idea of what I was ever going to do as any kind of a career, really. Um, and very naive, really, and very kind of um, simplistic approach to life. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I was incredibly lucky. When I came out of university, I managed to get a few jobs doing bits and pieces of this, that and the other. And then I, <laughs> I got the job playing in the old top rank suite on the Kingsway, which was five nights a week, uh, you know, five nights a week till two in the morning. And uh, it was a fantastic learning curve. We played all sorts of different styles of music, you know, from big band music, pop music on a Saturday, uh, even ballroom dancing music, all sorts. Of, so you get a real awareness of styles, you know. And also I was um, learning to arrange music at that point as well. So I, Johnny Francis, who was the band leader then, would allow me occasionally to write a few things for the band, blah, 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 you know. And um, that was an aspect of music making that I knew I really wanted to develop and wanted to become a big part of my life, which it has, you know. So, um, eventually, like all things come to an end, we got the sack from the ballroom because they were going to change the way it was going to go. So, um, I didn't really have a job. And amazingly, a phone call out of the blue came in, would I come to this theatre, because I lived locally, would I come to this theatre play piano in um, Jesus Christ Superstar, which was happening in that summer, summer of 84, I think if I got that right, yes, yeah, summer of 84. And I almost said no, because I had other work on, you know, but I, in the end I said, oh, this sounds quite good, this could be, you know, better money than what I'm going to earn. I'll turn down the other thing and I'll do the superstar thing. Um, and I did, and the musical director here was a guy called Martin Yates, uh, and a fantastic, wonderful, gifted pianist, and he's now a top-level conductor, you know, a great guy. Um, and I came in, I played piano in the band, and uh, we had a fantastic time, and... and we came to do the technical rehearsals, and because the show was so technical, um, we kept getting further and further behind. So they kept sending us away, you know. And I kept thinking, this is a very easy job, this, and all I'm doing is sitting around drinking tea, you know, uh, or going off to play snooker or something. But anyway, eventually we got the show done, and we, and we opened the show, and we played it every night, and it was fantastic. I, I loved it, I thought it was great. And then a really fortunate thing happened for me because um, the then manager here was a guy called Paul Dason. And he had some kind of falling out with Martin, or Martin got another job or something, so Martin said, I'm not coming back to do your pantomime. So I was in the band at the time, as a piano player, so Paul Dyson thought, well, I'd better get someone to do it then, because he used to do it all in-house here, you know. So he asked me, would I be interested in doing it? And my initial response was, I, I don't even know how to do it. I don't, don't know what that involves, really. Um, but I had a chat with Paul, I had a chat with the director, who was a wonderful guy who's passed away now, a guy called Dudley Stevens, great, great guy. And he was incredibly tolerant of my naivety, really, you know, because I didn't really know what I was doing. And um, we wrote the show together. I don't mean composed the show, I did all the musical arrangements. We had an eight-piece band at that time. 
Dudley outlined the shape of the songs that he wanted to do, you know. And um, we worked uh, in the cast that year. Was a, I was very fortunate because an old friend of mine from youth theatre level was um, Caroline Berry was in the cast. So I knew Caroline, so that made me feel a bit more comfortable with what was going on, you know. Uh, and uh, Paul Henry, the guy who used to play Benny in Crossroads, he was our headliner. But the second headliner was uh, the fantastic, fantastic Roy Barraclough. And Roy has passed away now, sadly, but Roy knew I was really struggling in rehearsal. And he was really kind to me, and he gave me loads of sort of tips and hints about how we can improve, blah blah blah, blah. And he was fantastic. And we came to the opening night of the show, and the show used to run, like, forever in those days, you know. And it all went incredibly well. We had a fantastic review from the Evening Post. And I thought, well, maybe I can do more of this then, you know. And lo and behold, I'm still tottering around this building doing my bits and bobs after all that time, you know. Um, I had a few, about 10 or 12 years where I didn't do their pantomime for them for various reasons, you know. And then I got invited to come back. And I said, well, okay, yeah, I'll do it. And I've done the last... Um, Barring lockdown, I've done the last three for them. So, which makes, in all, 25 pantomimes that I've done for them, not to mention the other shows that we've done here, you know. Um, which amazingly means that I, I've played in the pit here to well over a million people, which is absolutely bonkers, you know, really. Not a million different people, obviously, but a million people who've come and see stuff here, you know. And... Um, and I've been very lucky, very blessed, and very privileged. I'm a Swansea boy, born, you know, a mile from this theatre. I got my first job working in the old top rank suite, which was a mile from my parental home. My second decent job was working here. Um, so it's been a very um, big part of my life. And although things are not the same now, of course they're not, because the bands are very small now. But in those early days, when we had a lovely eight-piece band, two trumpets, saxophone, trombone, four in the rhythm section, it was an awesome job to have. I used to love every minute of it. It was brilliant, you know. I still love doing it. I still love playing panto. But it's not as joyous as it used to be in that sense, because there were eight of us all pulling in the same direction, you know. But still, we do our best. We make a big effort to make it happen. My love is the great variety performers. I'm not as interested in... Um, and this is going to sound awful now. I'm not as interested in the guys who are here because they've been in Neighbours or the guys who've been here because they've been uh, in the Gladiators. You know, in the early 90s, it was, you know, they were great guys, but they didn't really have an act. Whereas I love working with people who've got an act, you know. So when we've had, like, say, for example, with Bernie Clifton here. Bernie was fantastic, you know. Um, John Inman. Uh, and you know that some of the routines that John Inman was doing, they did back a hundred years or more, you know, to the proper old days of variety theatre, when you'd come and see a nine-act show in buildings like this, you know. Um, we've had people who perhaps haven't got a variety background, but who have actually got an act and are genuinely funny people. Um, like Joe Pasquale, for example. Joe is a, just a funny bloke. He's got funny bones, and he's the, he's the one act... Not, no, not, that's not quite true. But he's one of the acts who made me laugh every single day that we did the show. For different reasons, every day. He would be funny. The script was the same, but it was funny because he was funny. That's the thing. Uh, and the same with Little and Large. You know, uh, bless him, Eddie died last year or year before. And um, he was funny because he was a funny bloke. And they, they're, they're, they had an actual act. They were really great variety style performers, you know. And they always said they learned their craft from doing difficult and complicated work in men's clubs where you had to, you know, you, you really earned your money. And then they gradually went up the slope until eventually they're doing theatres and then they're doing TV and then, you know. But they'd worked hard to, to earn that, you know. The other guys we've had here, who I adored working with, um, we did a pantomime here with um, uh, Les Dennis. Um, Oh, who else was in it? Christopher Biggins was in it as well. That was a fantastic show because they, again, Les has got an act, but only he didn't really use the act in that show. And Biggins is so larger than life. Uh, uh, he was fabulous in the show. And uh, he broke his heart. In the final show we were here, he broke his heart. He cr absolutely cried because um, he, he just enjoyed being here and being part of this this fabulous old building. You know? um, 
I'm trying to think some of the other people that we've had here who I think have been awesome. Not, um, we had Rod Hull here run. Rod was bonkers, absolutely bonkers. Really funny, you know. Um, and again, you never knew when that was going to go. Absolutely off his head, you know. Absolutely bonkers. We've also had sort of really old school kind of performers here as well. Ken Goodwin, great comic, you know, he's fantastic, really great. We had uh, Dora Bryan here a few years ago uh, in, my memory serves me right, that was John Chalice's pantomime when we did Peter Pan here. And uh, John Chalice played the father uh, and, you know, Mr. Darling and Captain Hook, as, as they do, you know. And John Chalice was superb, what a, what a great guy, super actor, really on the case, just a, just a great book, you know. But... Um, Doyle was in that, Mike Doyle was in that show, uh, Dora Bryan was in that show, and Dora was f- fantastically bonkers. She was brilliant, really funny. Played this sort of comedy mermaid amongst other little bits and pieces she did as well. But um, she was a genuine eccentric, and she was, she'd appear at the wrong time in the show, bloody, bloody, bloody. All, so, you know, all little things would kind of go a bit wonky with her, you know. And there's a fantastic story about her that. Um, a lot of lot of actors, because we only see, we, you only see the back of the theatre when you're coming in, so you never see what the front looks like, you know. So anyway, Dora had been here for a few weeks and decided to, you know, in the morning off or in, I'll go for a walk, you know. So she went for a walk out through the stage door and round around down to the beach, back up through and across across the town, came through the other side like that, and eventually came to the front of the theatre and thought, oh, this is nice. There's another theatre here. How lovely. She went in and said to the box she she said, well, yeah, it's a lovely theatre. She said, what do you get on tonight? And the box office said, well, it's you. It's, it's the pantomime. You're in it, you know, which I think is a fabulous story. And that's very, that's very dormant. And you, sometimes she played to that image a little bit of being a bit ditzy as well, because that's, that, was, that was her image ever before she became an elderly lady, you know. But she was fabulous in the show. It was really funny and very, very physical for an elderly person as well. She was in her 80s, but she, she was great, you know, really, really good. I've also been uh, really fortunate. I've worked with Ruth Maddock here as well, and Ruth was outstanding, really funny, great person, uh, and a really, really good laugh, you know. Um, and Ruth has become a bit of a mate now. Whenever I see her, she's lovely, you know. Uh, a really good person and a delight to work with, really. Um, we had, in the same show, I think, in the same show, we had somebody else from Heidi High as well, Nicky Kelly with Paul Shane here. Paul was what a great guy, you know. Sadly, he's, he's, we've lost him now, but he was great, larger than life personality, and and um, he was one of those people. He didn't like to see anybody being done down. If he thought, if he thought the cleaner was having a hard time, he'd make it his business to make sure that cleaner wasn't having a hard time. You know, if he thought the theatre manager was having a hard time, he'd make sure that wouldn't happen. He was that kind of bloke. He hated seeing anybody. Um, being given, being done down, you know, he didn't like it, and he's he's very supportive and a great, great guy. I liked Paul very much. Ruth Maddock, consummate professional, fantastic, you know, good, great singer as well. Much more to Ruth than than you would think. But um, although she's consummate professional, we did have a, a an incident one afternoon where um, her head mic, they used to use head mics. So I think in those days, it was the mics there, was it there? I can't remember. But they use head mics and. Um, Loose head mic accidentally was left on while she went to the loo. So the audience were treated to Ruth coming to the loo during the show, which was really funny. Um, I, don't think, I don't think anybody... I knew what it was. I don't think, I'm not sure anybody else quite did, you know, but it was an absolutely brilliant moment. The, thing I, the, the weird thing about being an MD, a musical, um, that's a, a musical director, is that it's, it's a... It's a job that has many hats, really. You've got loads and loads of things that you need to, to know. And I didn't really know that as a young MD. Uh, but you gradually come to realise that, uh, A, you've got to be able to play. You don't have to be the world's greatest, but you have to be able to play in rehearsal. And you have to be very adaptable in rehearsal as well, because sometimes an artist will want the song, say, semitone lower. So you have to learn how to transpose. You have to learn to play in a different key. Um, you have to know what singers want. You have to be able to say to a singer, for example, uh, let's suppose, I'll just pull something out the air, let's suppose there was a top A flat at the end of the song, and the artist can reach it, but he's only going to reach it six times out of ten. Well, it's far better to say, do you know what, that's not going to happen on wet Wednesdays, is it, you know, when we've got two shows and you're going to struggle. Let's put it in a key where it's going to be there 
nine and a half times out of ten. Let's just drop it, say a semitone. So you're only doing a top G instead of a top A flat. It's just going to be better for you and for them. Because an audience, when things like that are a bit creaky around the edges, they often don't know why they don't like it, but they feel uncomfortable and you can sense it. You can feel it, you know. Um, so that's, that, that's another thing that you need to know. You need to be good at dealing with people. You need to be able to talk to people and sort of, you know, make these suggestions to people without making it sound like you're, you know, trying to patronise what they do or whatever. Um, you, you have to be able to write musical arrangements because even, even if you're using bought-in things, any director worth his salt will say, well, can we have this there? Can we have this there? Can we have this there? And you've got to be able to knock those things up for the band in short order, really. So that's something you... Uh, uh, and if I've got any skills, those that's my particular skill, I think. That's something I do a lot of. I do... Uh, th and again, thanks to working here, really. I've always had an interest in musical arrangement, but that's something I do now. It's more or less... I probably... The biggest part of my living is doing musical arrangements for people, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably true. Um... I've been very fortunate. I've, I, I do lots for the BBC Orchestra, BBC National Orchestra of Wales. I've orchestrated for Welsh National Opera. Uh, I, I've just, um, I just did a, a well, a big load of rock arrangements for a Welsh artist. I'd say it's been. I've been very fortunate, and that's taught me, that's given me uh, an income stream that I think a lot of people who can only play don't have. So it's been quite a good thing for me, I think. I'd be lying if I said things always go correctly because sometimes, you know, you're doing the show 80 odd times. There is always going to be the odd moment when things go a little bit wrong, you know. Um, and most of the time, an audience isn't aware of that because there's such small things that go wrong. And sometimes the things that go wrong are very funny, the things that go wrong on stage as well. But there are things that happen. Um, when we had the eight piece band here, uh, <laughs> I think this is. I hope you find this funny, but I think this is a really funny story. Um, I had a wonderful guitarist, a friend of mine called Richard Locke. Sadly, Richard's no longer with us. But Rich, Richard played guitar and banjo. And he decided that um, halfway through the run that he would bring in a separate amplifier for the banjo. So in the afternoon show, we put the separate amplifier in. So with the guitar in one amp, the banjo in the other amplifier. But what he hadn't taken into account was his banjo was on or off. It didn't have a volume controller. It was either on or it was off. So you had to turn it down at the amp. Well, he forgot to turn it down at the amp. So he placed the banjo by the amplifier, having played it. And very, very slowly, but very quietly, the, the amplifier began to feed back. Well, the amplifier was mic'd, so it was feeding back through the theatre as well. But the feedback it produced was exactly like somebody on a motorbike a long, long way away. So it sounded exactly as if somebody was going... And gradually... And it was one of those things... You, you didn't notice it for a few minutes. This went, on, this went on for about ten minutes. You didn't notice it for a while. And you said, what is that? What's that? What's that sound? And it's getting louder and louder. So I could, the, the sound guy at the time was a very good friend of mine, a guy called Splinter, Tony Davis. And I sort of stuck my head over the pit. I said, what's that? What? He said, I don't know, I have no idea. And he's there, you know, scripture fade as well. Then he comes running down the front. He's listening to the PA, you know, he's having a look. Having a look at the artist, see if somebody's mic's going wrong. And all the time, Richard, bless him, is blissfully sitting there by the manager. And this is getting louder and louder and louder. So eventually it's this. And the artists are looking in the pits. What the hell is that? Yeah. Even now, there's even an audience looking out the boxes. Going, what is that noise? It was the banjo. So eventually we worked out where it was. And Richard, shamefacedly and with much embarrassment, remembered to turn it off on the sun. It doesn't sound like a funny story when you tell it like that. But it is, it, at that time, that was absolutely hilarious. It was really brilliant. And... Um, well, a fond memory, really. There are, there are sometimes completely ridiculous things that happen in the pit as well, um, which are absolutely insane. Um, like, for example, we had, a, we had this African sequence once. I can't remember what the pantomime was. Now, but, uh, so one of the boys, uh, Beefy, a friend of mine, he was playing congas. 
doing the secret. Yeah. So he's there really grooving with his congas and we open the plane away. And all the time there are these theatrical flashes going off, so which is like a little um, pyrotechnic thing which goes off and you get a flash of smoke and all this and any other. And on top of those little theatrical flashes, there's a, a little sort of circle of thin paper which just occasionally catches fire and just floats down. It lasts for about, I don't know, five seconds perhaps, you know, and then it will burn away. Well, as we were playing this number, a theatrical flash went off and a piece of burning paper landed on Beefy's shoulder. So I shouted over him, Beef, Beef, you're on fire. And he said, Oh, thank you very much. It is going really well, isn't it? You know? No, you are actually on fire. And he was. You ought to be there, but it's a, it's a funny story. A, a really lovely thing about working here is that there's always been something of a family feel about this theatre. It's always felt, to me anyway, that you come here and you know a lot of the people here. OK, it's changing a bit now. But I do think a lot of the artists who come to work here also feel uh, an attachment to this great old building as well, you know. Um, my father passed away in uh, 1994 and uh, I was it was during panto season I was doing panto at the time and we had Windsor Davis was here in panto that year and um, all the way through he knew he found out from somebody I knew that my father wasn't you know, I, we knew my father wasn't well you know. um, so pretty much every day he'd say to me uh, in the, and he'd adopt the Windsor Davis persona you know he'd say uh all right, good boy, good boy, right boy, I was the old man, you know, he'd say that, and, and I'd say, well, you know, up and down Windsor, you know. So we draw in towards the end of the season, and on the last Saturday of the season, um, Windsor said to me, he said, uh, what are you doing between shows today? And I said, well, I can pop up to see the old man, because my, my family home, the, the home my father lived in, was less than, well, maybe half a mile from this theatre, you know. And he said, um, I'll come up with you. And he came up to the house, to sit with my father, who he knew was very ill, you know. And uh, my father's favourite TV show of all time was Grand Slam, you know. And for Windsor Davis to come in to the house like that was a massive deal for the old man. He was really made up about it, you know. And that was on the last Saturday. We had a show on the Sunday. Uh, and my father passed away on the Tuesday. So it was a fantastic moment for my old man. And that's kind of what I mean about... Um, Theatres like this engendering some some kind of special relationship with people. I don't know. I don't know how that works. Maybe that's a bit sentimental. I don't know. But that was a brilliant thing for Windsor to have done. And um, it, it was one of, again. It's one of those things as well that sometimes you know the great and the good do things for publicity reasons or whatever. But sometimes the great and the good do things because they actually care about stuff. You know. And that's what Windsor did really. And it was a fantastic thing to do. Uh, will never be forgotten. Certainly by me. And I know that my old man's last few days of life were really made up by that, you know. It was a fantastic thing to, for him to have done. My, one of my biggest regrets, I think I was born out of my time, I would have been better in an older time when there were more variety performers about. And uh, that, it would be fantastic to me. I know, for example, that in the days of the old empire, that Laurel and Hardy performed here in the twilight of their career. Morecambe Wise performed here, in, you know, all sorts of people, really. And that would have been my... Fourth day, really. My other regrets, I think, about working in this fantastic building, no regrets about working here, but I missed the opportunity. I did very little with John Chilvers while John was the manager here. My time really began after John had retired, you know. Although after retirement, John's really kind to me as well. He gave me a massive lot of music, old copies of this, that, and the other, you know. So I'm, I'm sad that I missed the opportunity to work with a guy who was a fantastic and gifted individual, you know. And of course, the other regret I have is Ronnie and Ryan did, you know, five pantomimes here. And the opportunity to have worked with those guys would have been fantastic, would have been absolutely awesome. And I was just too young and I missed out on all that, really. Um, how I would have loved to have done that, because when I was a kid, we used to watch uh, Ronnie and Ryan on the, te on the telly in English and then we'd watch it in Welsh as well because it was funny in both languages and I'm not my Welsh isn't very good but it was funny because again Ryan was a funny person he was he had funny bones you know he couldn't could not be funny you know and an immense talent as well I've been fortunate enough um, I've worked with Aaron his son many times he's a, he's a good friend Aaron a lovely lovely guy um, and we did well Aaron did most of the music but I helped him out with the music for 
there was a, <clears throat> a film about Ryan and Ronnie. It was made, gosh, more than 10 years ago now. But we did all of that together, and that was a fantastic thing too. But it did make me hanker for, I wish I'd had that opportunity to work with those two fantastic entertainers in their prime, in this building. That's my regret, I suppose, really. I think that one of the things that people uh, forget is that you can't buy history. It's got to happen. You can't buy it. Now, this building's been here since 1897. It has history. It has stuff. Um, it's... And you can't buy that. You can't buy that. I mean, we've got... You can have the most spectacular of new venues. We've got a new venue. Come across. That would be fantastic. It would be an awesome venue. But you can't buy the history that this place has. And I think that that's important to the town. I think, I think people in Swansea have a, an affiliation with this building because of that sense of history with it, you know? Um, and in my small, the small contributions I've, I've ever made to this place, I feel that as well. I feel a real affiliation with this building and I think it'll always be a big part of my life, whether I ever come here to work again or not. Um, and I think that the town deserves that. And the building deserves that as well. And I think that we need to look after it. We need to cherish it. We need not to be afraid to spend some money on it, be when it needs money spending, because, trust me, you will never get another one. You'll never have this again. There'll never be anything like this. You can have the most spectacular new build theatre, wherever. There'll never be anything like this. There never will be. And... Long may it continue, because the town and the sense of history about this building, we deserve that.